the Amash project. All right, everybody. Well, well welcome back to uh, to uh, the talk, which is uh, by Dr. Young H. Chi, who is at uh, one of uh, England's leading universities uh, as a lecturer in. Um, is it Oriental Studies at the Department of Oriental Studies? Studies yeah. He is from South Korea and has had a very long-term interest in the UFO subject, and has done a lot of research. And I was very surprised when he. Uh, contacted us about his subject matter, particularly his ideas on the escalation of um, alien abduction with the increase in um, environmental um, chaos and catastrophe and what have you, crisis. So I was very interested to hear how he might draw those two elements or subjects together because, of course, um, the environment is extremely important. So I'm going to pass you over to uh, Dr. Young Hei Chi and uh, welcome him as a first time speaker also to Amash. So we're, again, we're very grateful for all the work that all you presenters have done. Thank you. So handing over, thank you. Well, nice to see you all. Can you hear me clearly? I just learned the time uh, allocated to me is 55 minutes, not 75 minutes. So I just removed a great chunk of uh, my presentation. Uh, I think the best way to do is to read the scripts rather than talking uh, using these screens here. I'm not quite used to use, uh, using PowerPoint. This is the first time I made PowerPoint. So please bear with, with my, my accent for 55 minutes, hopefully. Um, I think it's a very good time to leave because I'm going to say something horrible. Um, well, the main thing I want to say is perhaps human civilization is coming to an end. Uh, I said perhaps. Uh, there's nothing certain, really, in this area. Um, that's the gist of what I'm talking, what I'm going to talk this evening. Um, let me start with uh, talking about Dr. Jane, David Jacobs, who is an abduction researcher in the United States. He made two arguments, very important arguments, in relation to alien abduction. The first one is the primary purpose of abduction is to produce hybrids human-alien hybrids. And the second one is the primary purpose of this hybrid project is to colonize the Earth. He bases the second argument on two observations. The first one is the mass production of the second uh, generation hybrids. Aliens produce hybrids not only between themselves and humans, but also between these alien-human hybrids and humans, uh, humans. Um, and these uh, second generation hybrids, you can call it, call them or whatever, uh, three quarter hybrids. These second generation hybrids look quite similar to humans, and it is quite difficult to distinguish them from ordinary humans, even if they are mixed uh, together with us. The second observation is that uh, some of the second generation hybrids behave quite nastily. So they are likely to be fitting for some nasty purpose. They are actually walking, according to David Jacobs, among us without being noticed. And they are carrying out very sinister clandestine mission. And he defines this mission uh, as colonization of the Earth. I happily accept the first argument. The uh, abduction is primarily for Excuse producing, and many or the majority of abduction stories entail um, a stage of genetic manipulation or hybrid production in one way or another. Abductees have their ovum or sperm routinely extracted and um, they are also often involved in sexually oriented actions with aliens or even with other human abductees on board under the influence of mind control by aliens. Reports of glass containers full of uh, hybrid uh, fetus 
uh, or the encounter with the hybrid toddlers on board is a, a common, very common feature of abduction uh, stories. Uh, particularly female abductees frequently find themselves with unusual symptoms of pregnancy and often find their fetus stolen without knowing exactly when it happened, when it happened, how it happened, and why it happened. All these aspects sufficiently justify the argument that aliens are really intent on producing hybrids for whatever the reason might be. However, the second argument is less convincing because I cannot shake up the feeling that his judgment is based on overtly anthropocentric failure judgment. When in human history a superior civilization, technical uh, civilization, met an inferior one, uh, the usual outcome has been domination and subjugation. Yes, he's right. Uh, the typical example is the extermination of the Aztec civilization by Spanish conquerors in the 16th century. But can we really apply experiences from human history to an interstellar or interdimensional experience? If colonization is what aliens are really intending to do, then I think they are doing it at a quite a wrong time. Because now humans have now more advanced scientific knowledge and more sophisticated uh, technology. And also, human race also have a more centralized political organization worldwide. So uh, we have now a little bit of ability to uh, organize a united front to resist any intervention from outside, although resistance may not be fully effectual yet. So they could have done that, or they should have done that uh, much earlier when humans were much more docile, ignorant, and naive. So I believe if they really wanted to colonize the Earth, they should have started the hybrid project much earlier, many, many centuries earlier. This recent alien intervention in human history requires, therefore, an alternative explanation. Let me explain this alternative account by putting the alien visitation against the wider time frame of human history. In order for extraterrestrial civilizations to be able to reach us, their civilization must have evolved for many, many hundred years, or many thousands, or even many millions uh, of years. This means that they would have discovered us a long time ago. The probability that we were found by them just in the 19th century or 20th century is almost nil. This requires us to look at the phenomenon of abductions from a quite a different angle. Because they could have visited us long before modern time, and since they would have had the power to abduct us at any time at their will, the abduction would have been a routine feature of those past visitations. And bear in mind that normally abduction uh, uh, incident is a very special occasion, uh, very often involving uh, personal traumatic experiences and memories. So if it happened habitually uh, in the past, those who had uh, these traumatic experiences must have left some record behind, either in writing or in stories. But we don't have such records left uh, in the pre-modern period. Even in modern times, the pre-Second World War encounters usually involve visual sightings rather than physical abduction. And so I believe the phenomenon of abduction belongs almost exclusively uh, to the post-Second World War period. Just as abduction is a novel phenomenon to us, so is the hybrid project. There are a few records of contact with uh, aliens in the pre-1945 period, but we rarely hear that human-alien encounters involved 
any forms of genetic engineering. So we can say that although alien vegetation predates the 20th century, the phenomenon of abduction and the hybrid project largely uh, belongs to the post-Second World War period. Why did aliens, we can ask, embark on abduction and hybrid project only in the latter half of the 20th century? What I suggest here is that they started it as a response to the rapidly uh, aggravating environmental condition of this planet. To show why I think so, I will first explain the trend of climate change and the scale of the threat that human species are now facing. And then I will go on to mention some cases in which aliens appeared to be giving very serious warning about the Earth's environment and the impending demise of human civilization. Oh, I have already explained this. Yeah. Um, according to the 2007 fourth IPCC reports, a UN intergovernmental uh, panel uh, for climate change report on the global climate change, for the last 100 years between 1906 and 2005, the global surface temperature rose 0.075 degrees Celsius per decade. But for the last 50 years, it rose as twice high as that, which is 0.13 degrees per decade. Recently, it is increasing uh, even faster, that is 0.2 degrees every 10 years. The pre-industrial average temperature was 13.7 degrees Celsius, but it rose to 14 in 2000 and further up to 14.5 in 2005. What is the consequence of this? Many natural systems are very seriously being affected. For example, eastern parts of North and South America, Northern Europe and Northern and Central Asia have observed significantly increased precipitation. Droughts have become more intense and longer over wider areas since the 1970s. Cold days, cold nights, and frost have become less frequent, while hot days, hot nights, and heat waves have become more frequent. And there is clear, clear evidence uh, for an increase in intense tropical cyclone activity in the North Atlantic since about 1970, which is correlated with the increases of tropical sea temperature rise. All these observations clearly confirm that there has been a rapid climate change in recent times and that it has been putting tremendous stress uh, on the planetary ecosystem. Now you may want to ask, is this change unique to our time? And this question is very crucial to the topic uh, we are dealing with today. If you put the figures I just mentioned against the long-term time scale, you will see the answer is clearly yes. The screen you are seeing there shows the changes in the level of atmospheric concentration of the three main culprits of global warming, which is carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous uh, oxide. These GHGs, greenhouse gases, have increased markedly as a result of human activities since 1950 and now they far exceed uh, the pre-industrial values uh, determined from ice core. If you expand the time scale back into the last 150 years, then you will see the long-term trend more clearly. This is a zoomed-in graph of the change in carbon dioxide, um, which is the main culprit for global warming. Like other two GHGs, the CO2 concentration level had been more or less stable for the last 10,000 years until the start of the industrial age around in 1750. However, since the time, 1750, the level has went up, as you see here, not incrementally, not even exponentially, but almost 
vertically. The IPCC report makes a conclusive judgment about the trend and the cause of global warming. It says, warming of the climate system is unequivocal, and most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic GHG concentrations. Of particular significance in relation to alien vegetation are the graphs you see in the inlets. You see here the radical increase of CO2 emission from 1950 uh, 50 onward. And this, uh, if the line indicates, for example, kind of you know, stock, stock price uh, 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 change, then perhaps 1950 is the best uh, time uh, to enter the market. But if that indicates something ominous, perhaps there's the time you have to uh, come out. Likewise, if non-human species uh, were watching humans with serious concerns about the survivability of human civilization, then the time around 1950 would have been uh, a very decisive moment for a kind of action. Either intervene or, or give up or do something about it. So the mid 20th century truly stands as a historic point from the perspective of planet's ecological condition. And this is exactly the time when alien intervention in human affairs began in an unprecedented scale. People started to report UFO sightings around the world from this time on. Again, and this is the time when we began to hear about abductions of humans by aliens. Obviously, the most famous one is the first one of this kind is the, the case of Antonio de las Boas in 1957, which was soon to follow by the case of Betty and Barney Hill case, 1961. As we see in these two early cases, the element of a sexual contact and, and, and genetic engineering were prominent, prominently featured from the very beginning of abduction history. What it suggests is that, on the one hand, aliens were watching us drifting towards uh, a kind of uh, environmental catastrophe. And on the other hand, they began to massively interfere with human affairs. The timing may look just accidental. But given that aliens massively turned up only from 1950s, Although they could have done that much earlier, centuries earlier, if they had wished to do so, it is statistically implausible to suppose that the two developments are just a mere chance event. So it is more rational, I believe, to assume that there is a certain kind of a necessary relationship between the alien visitation and the environmental crisis. I just said environmental crisis. Do the figures I mentioned earlier really point to a kind of crisis? I will present the three short accounts of pros uh, prospective climate change to show how likely it is for human species to face extinction. The first account is again from the 2007 IPCC report. It says here, it all depends on what kind of developmental model we choose for the next 80 years. On the one axis, uh, countries can choose either a development-intensive model or environment-conscious model. On the other axis, whichever the model countries uh, might choose, they can do this either on a highly convergent concerted or globalized basis, or highly uh, divergent uh, regionalized basis. If, very luckily, they all follow environment conscious change through a globally consisted system, then by the end of the century, which is about eight years from now on, the world can just manage to hold the surface temperature rise at 2.0 degrees in Celsius. Uh, this figure is relative to the um, average temperature of the period between 1980 and 99. But even if the world manages to hold 
the temperature rise to 2.0 degrees, about 20 to 30% of all animals and plants on the Earth are likely to perish. That's the prediction of the IPCC uh, panel at the end of this century. However, this is the luckiest scenario, as I said. If we choose to keep on with maximum economic vitality, that is pursuing a maximum GDP growth through a highly globalized economic system, relying upon intensive use of fossil fuels, the surface temperature will rise on average by up to four degrees Celsius. The 2007 report predicted that if the projected figure exceeds 3.5 degrees, 40 to 70 percent of all animals and plants on the Earth will face extinction. Then you could imagine what will happen if the projection rise, projected rise equals or exceeds 4.0 degrees. Yet, this account is still a conservative estimation. The way the cooling systems of the Earth works actually makes the time left much shorter than the IPCC report would have us believe. James Hansen, who is a NASA scientist, points out that the surface temperature captured to the present level is a result of hard work by the cooling Earth cooling agents. Rivers, lakes, glaciers, oceans, and Arctic and Antarctic uh, ices, they all observe heat uh, from the air and emit it slowly at later stages, thus uh, mitigating the effects of surface temperature rise. But these cooling effects should not be left working too hard and for too long time. In the end, they will vomit out the heat that they have observed so far and, and thereby accelerates the rise of the surface temperature. So there is a threshold, there must be one. And beyond this point, their capacity to observe heat can no longer support the optimum condition of human existence. We call this point a tipping point. Once the system exceeds this tipping point, the global warming turns into an unstoppable process. The question is, where is this tipping point? Hansen's calculation points to 450 ppm as the most likely candidate. ppm here stands for parts per million, uh, referring to the level of carbon dioxide or uh, carbon di dioxide equivalent uh, atmospheric concentration. Only within this boundary, Hansen argues, the world would be able to hold the surface temperature uh, in the safe zone. I will show the present global concentration level. As of July 2012, if you look at uh, CO2now.org, uh, you will see the present level of uh, CO2 concentration level. So until we hit the point, how many years do we have left? It is very simple arithmetic. There has been two ppm increase every year for the last several decades. So supposing that we manage to keep the increase rate at the present level, then we have 27 years, nine months uh, before we hit the tipping point. If we fail to hold the increase rate at the present two ppm level, then obviously the time left will be much shorter than 27 years, nine months which means the surface temperature will reach the tipping point long before 2040. Now the question is, within the 20, next 27 years, can we make any serious change in the way we conduct politics and economy? The Kyoto Protocol, protocol has been uh, adopted in 1997, about uh, 15 years ago, as an international platform designed to, to, to help member states to reduce their national GHG uh, emissions so that the GHG concentration can be held at a safe level. Do you know what US government did? The world's biggest economy and the signatory to the protocol, they, ha they have never ratified. 
And what did Canada do? The second largest, largest source of CO2 emission per capita, they pulled out of it last December. But can we blame US and Canadian governments? Certainly, they are not wrong in thinking that conforming to the protocol will seriously uh, uh, slow down the economy because uh, it is perhaps too costly. But under the nation, present nation states system, they have a full right to conduct their own affairs free of intervention from outside or from other countries. Likewise, we don't have any rights to meddle with uh, the economic policies of next generation super economies, such as Brazil, India, China, and Russia. If you take all these structural impediments into account, then Kyoto Protocol will most possibly end with no substantial fruition. In the absence of an effective international regime to fight GHG emission, which is most likely to be the case in my view, there will be no way to make the concentration level peak within the limit of 450 ppm before 2040. Yet, even the threat of a rapidly approaching tipping point is dwarfed by even greater threat. This is the potential danger of permafrost. We have very strong evidence that the point of no return can arrive much earlier than 2040. Permafrost refers to a layer of soil, rock, and mud that is frozen all year round in the vast mass, uh, landmass in Siberia, Alaska, and in some parts of Canada. I'll show you the photos of uh, permafrost. And this is permafrost in Canada, as you see there, it stretches down many tens or hundreds of meters underneath. Another one, permafrost in Canada, Yukon area. Permafrost in East Siberia. Another one is in East Siberia. For the last 100,000 years, plants have been growing in summer and dying in winter in these areas. When they die, the organic substances get frozen into a thick layer of soil, few tens or hundreds of meters down from the surface. As air temperature rises, so does the temperature of the ground. And this causes permafrost to melt into a blacky, bubbly soup consisting of ice, decayed organic material, and mud, while emitting methane into the air. What is dangerous with this process is the methane's power to retain heat in the air is 23 times greater than CO2. Once methane is released into the air, it can raise the atmospheric temperature at an incredible speed. According to Edward Shaw of the University of Florida, there is about 1,600 billion tons of carbon locked in permafrost. And about 100 billion of them could be released into the air this century. If this happens, then this would have a warming effect equivalent to 270 years of carbon dioxide emissions measured at the present level. So it is not difficult to understand why so many scientists treat it as a doomsday sludge. Um, the release of methane can lead to a chain reaction in which the warming temperature causes more permafrost to melt and so more gas to be released. And this causes a spiraling increase in global warming. Once this happens, and there's nothing we can do about it. This is why climatologists call permafrost an environmental time bomb. So we must ask, when is it going to melt? In 2005, Judith Markand of Oxford University 
and Sergei Kolpotin at Tomsk State University in Russia examined the permafrost in West Siberia and found this. They had already started to melt. They started to thaw in 2001 or 2002. They say the permafrost in the region had never before melted since it was formed at the end of the last ice age, which was about 11,000 years ago. In other words, this is the first time that uh, the permafrost uh, began to melt. Katie Walter at University of Alaska also reported in 2005 the permafrost in Alaska was thawing from underneath even in winter and greenhouse gases were escaping into the atmosphere at a frightening speed. Uh, particularly, the temperature in West Siberia is rising faster than any other places in the world. For the last 40 years, the surface temperature rose by 3 degrees here, that is 0.75 degrees every 10 years. Given that the global temperature rose on average 0.2 degrees every 10 years, as, as I said earlier, the temperature, rise, temperature is rising 3.75 times faster in this region. The three pictures of the current state of climate change broadly cohere with the warning given by the Archbishop, Archbishop of Canterbury about an impending environmental doom. In a sermon on 25th of March 2009, the Archbishop strictly warned, saying that God will not guarantee a happy ending in this world when it comes to the environmental crisis. Humans were given by God terrible freedom to inflict immeasurable damage to themselves, not only as an individual, but also as a race. What he's talking about here is the extinction of a human race, not just as a possibility, but as a most realistic and imminent possibility. So far, we have seen what damages we have inflicted on our planet in terms of global warming. Most climatologists agree that the world is passing uh, through a very critical moment, and even the Archbishop of Canterbury has warned us of environmental doomsday. But it's not only scientists and theologians, but also non-human species who appear to be greatly concerned about the survivability of human species. Let me go back to the question of abduction and ask, to what extent does the abduction phenomenon entail environmental element? I looked at a number of abduction cases which had implications for environmental crisis, and according to the degree of its relevance, I have categorized them into two types. One, the observer communicative type, and two, the participatory instructive type. Let me explain main features of these two types. The first one is the observer communicative type. This one involves communication about the present or future condition of the planet, and the main purpose on the part of aliens appears to be to communicate about impending critical condition of the Earth, and yet, without specifically mentioning what the danger involves, uh, what causes it, or what to do about it. Abductees are shown various images of the Earth in holograms or on flat screen monitors. They see trees lay fallen on barren lands, forests are totally devastated, bodies of animals and humans are strewn about, or strange chemical and industrial materials cover the Earth's surface. Just to show one example, let me play a video clip of an Amarshi experience, Amari Keale. Is Mari here today? Oh, you are there. You'll be here in a minute. <laughs> I met Mari last December uh, in London, a much meeting, but I will use uh, interview material done by Joanne because it, it has a clearer voice and the recording quality is much better than mine and the, the contents is exactly the same. By the way, how many of you have seen this video? 
some yes I know there were two standing behind me I know there were two standing behind me I could feel one here and one here and they felt quite tall they didn't feel small I could feel the presence I could feel them and they were probably a foot or two taller than me and um, when I was in this place it was all white all I could see for just for as far as my eyes could see were little plants all in little pots Thousands, millions of them mill rows and rows and rows of plants going on for you know as far as I could see you know into the distance so I don't know how big this place was or were they all kinds of different plants No, they're all exactly the same oh, all right. exactly all about a foot high all exactly the same and as I was looking down I did see there were some little beings, but they weren't people or anything, or they're tiny little things like this, like mm. not much bigger than the plants, but really thin and like those tiny little like monkeys. Two, one, 18 inches or two feet tall, perhaps. Well, yeah. Is that yeah, about yeah. two foot? Yeah. Well, very, they, they just looked dark and I couldn't see features. They were just sort of mm. shadows mainly because mm. they were quite far away. I just saw them. They were small. And um, I just heard a voice in my head. And uh, I know it was the one on this side that spoke, and it was a man's voice in English, mm -hmm. I remember. And it, he just said, you can ask two questions. So, of course, I said, well, what's with all these plants here, and what's going on? And the answer was, uh, these are for the new planet Earth. And that was all, nothing else. These are for the new planet Earth. And next of all, I remember carried on walking. I don't even remember if I was walking, because I don't remember a floor. I don't know if I was floating. Mm. But I remember, I mean, I wasn't in my, my right mind because I know I would have asked a lot more questions yes, or looked yeah. around. But mm -hmm. it was either I was totally at ease and didn't need to ask because I already knew or mm -hmm. they have you under some sort of control that you can't actually yes. ask. Yeah. I, I, re I think probably that's So did you find yourself like going down by these plants or did you go elsewhere in the ship? Or um, this? We just carried on walking and we walked this way and the plants were sort of going that way but I didn't, as I was walking down, we didn't pass the plants so I assumed right. we went another direction. But it looked the same, it was still all white and still looked well, the same. When they, when they said to you about this, the new earth, did that seem kind of normal? It seemed very you? normal to me. Right. I said, oh, okay, right. you know, okay. that kind of, not like we're as, if you already, earth, as if you already had information. Yeah, as, if, as, if, as, if, as, if, as if I already, already knew, knew and it was totally yeah. acceptable and it's for yeah. the new earth and, oh, okay, because I know in my right mind I would have said, well, what's the new earth? Tell me mm. more information. I want to know. I want yeah. to know. And I would have really asked, but you don't, um, you can't no, do that. No, it didn't, didn't occur to you. You can't. Well, it's not that it doesn't occur to you. You can't. All ah, right. It's like, um, you, you can't speak, basically, yeah. you can't interact the way you would normally on yes. a, a no yeah. realistic level mm. like this. Mm. So either they have you under some sort of trance or hypnosis or you don't need to ask because you already mm. know everything and it's... Yes, yes. So that, they're the two options that I'm yeah. left with, so I don't uh, know And what one. about the second question? The second question, um, we carried on and um, I just remember then there was people everywhere but people were, they weren't like the rows of plants, they were in rows, long ways, like this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how far they went up, I didn't look, but I just remember the people next to me, in front of me. Yes. And I have their faces embedded in my mind, I can describe what they were wearing even. Again, would, these, would, would, they, would you call them human? Yeah, yeah, they were just yeah. like us, they were yeah. normal people, they were normal yeah. people, all wearing different clothes, um, some were wearing, you know, long nighty kind of things, maybe they were abductees, I don't know, but they were definitely humans, mm -hmm. and none of them were talking, it was completely silent, and they were just all, they seemed to be just all standing there, looking straight ahead, and as I came up, closer to this, I remember the one lady, she had long hair and a long white sort of gown to probably about hair. So I remember her distinctly because I was right next to her. And as I came up behind her, she, I saw she was looking at a screen. Uh -huh. This screen was just, I mean, it wasn't attached to anything. And you couldn't see it from different angles. I could see it. So were there it. lots of little they, they screens? Were all, yeah, they were all, all individual they screens? They were all looking at screens. All but, individual yeah, ones? Yeah, oh, yeah. wow. Tiny, wow. like um, probably... Like on like, Virgin Atlantic? <laughs> Maybe yeah, like a fourteen inch, but they they weren't um, they weren't even physical things because no. you couldn't see them from up there, and I couldn't see them. Almost from like a holographic. Could it be like a hologram? Yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. could you see it? And um, I looked I looked at the screen over this lady's shoulder, and um, th 
the image, they were all being shown images, I don't know if they were all the same, but um, the one I saw was just um, beautiful pictures of the earth, you know, sea, fish jumping up and lovely mountains and things like that, and it just sort of, like a black, just went across the screen, and it changed to just a horrible, horrible, horrible sight, I'll never forget it as long as I live, it was like, um, it was like this black, Gungy stuff had come up out of the ground, and it wasn't like uh, like oil. Or it was like like an oil, like oil, but yeah. like quicksand as well in oh a way, right. and horrible stuff. And it just it covered like everything was covered in it, and it covered the even the sea. It was like the fish, everything was dead. I could see all dead things. I could see legs sticking up out of this mm. thing, like hooves, you know, like some mm. animals with hooves. Kind and of, uh, black fluid, intelligent energy. No, it was actual physical. It was like the Earth had like been. The glow, the movie, the glow. No, this was um, this was like um, it was like you know when you you get a, uh, a volcano and it just covers everything and it's all like flowing and everywhere. So it was just. But it was black. The, the Earth was being yeah, consumed. Black. It was coming up. Yeah, it was coming up. Like at, yeah, it was coming up out of the Earth, and it seemed to have killed everything. As far as I could see. Dream or the no, this was on, on when I, what I saw on the ship. What these people were looking at on the screen. So this was a small screen. Yeah. This lady were who's black entities, tendrilic life forms, anything that lived or sea um, creature type stuff. No, I didn't see anything like that. It just looked like there was horrible black sludge that had killed everything on Earth. All the plants were dead, and animals were dead, and fish were dead, and so it was like it was just everything went grey and black. And all the beauty was gone, you know, the sun was gone and the trees were gone and things like that. It was just horrible. Did that devastated. Like the film, uh, the Yellow Submarine, where the blue meanings, the blue essence comes and destroys everything. No? I don't know, I didn't see that. I didn't see it coming. It was already there, but it was like you know, bubbling, plopping, up. bubbling up and it seemed yeah. to be coming out of the earth and it covered, covered everything that I could see in front of me. And, and, and uh, was there anything else after that that you saw on the screen that you remember? Well, that's all I remember saying, and yeah. then they, I heard the voice saying, you can ask your second question. And I said, um, well, what's happening with all these people? What are they doing here? And the answer was, they're being categorised. And that's all it said, they're being categorised. What are aliens doing here? One feature that stands out is educating abductees about the damages done to the Earth. The image of the damaged earth is shown not only, not only to individuals, but also to a group of people, sometimes to a group of hundreds, many hundreds, in a setting of large uh, visual, uh, something like a computer workshop. The other feature is that aliens are doing this without instructive messages, specifically related to the images being shown. They just let the abductees see the image and leave what to make out of it just to the abductees themselves. The second type, there are some more things to talk about type one, but I'll just skip over to second type, which is the participatory instructive type. Here, aliens specifically direct the abductees' attention to environmental problems. They mention clearly a possible catastrophe or directly involve the abductees in the process of educating others. The abduction of Linda Cotill is a case in point. When Cotill was abducted in November um, 1986 near Brooklyn Bridge in New York, there are one world-renowned politician and his two uh, security guards. Uh, who happened to be watching this incident uh, from a very close distance. On that night, they discovered Cotill in a nearby river beach. She approached them holding a dead fish in her hand and said, see what you have done to this fish. Small aliens were standing beside her uh, when this happened, and if you closely look at the record, then it will become very clear that she was talking to the, these men on the aliens' behalf. Basically, the aliens' message here uh, is quite straightforward. The aliens were protesting about uh, the harms down to the waters of the Earth where pollution could no longer support life. Statistics of the two types shows 
that there are relatively fewer incidents in the second category, but they have greater significance or they have a greater degree of clarity in terms of the message transmitted. Here, aliens specifically mention the danger associated with the environmental deterioration, and they seem to be doing so without any, any strings, if you like. One of the most important cases uh, belonging to this category is the incident at Ariel Primary School in the village of Ruwa in Zimbabwe. I'm sure you, you have seen the, this is a very famous case, so uh, many of you have already seen this video clip. On 15 or 14 September 1994, 62 children of this school uh, saw an alien spaceship landing near to their school uh, ground. Two aliens were seen standing on the spaceship or hovering of, uh, above it, and one of the children got a kind of telepathic message uh, from the aliens. And this is uh, from John Mack's interview with the girl, uh, and I'll just shortly play it here, about two minutes. What I thought was maybe the world's going to end, maybe they're telling us the world's going to end. Um, well, why do you think they might want us to be scared? Because um, we, maybe because we, never, we don't look after the planet, um, the area properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me, this is, is this an idea that uh, you have had before that we don't look after the planet properly in the air? Or did this idea come to you when you had this experience? When I had this experience. Mm -hmm. And how did that idea come to you from this experience? This is a little hard, but try, try to be with me here, okay? When you, how did this idea come to you when you had this experience? I just felt all horrible inside. You felt horrible. At what point did you feel that? When you saw the craft or at, when you got home at night? Or when I got home. You had that horrible feeling when you got home? Yes. And say more about that horrible feeling, Lisa. What was it like? It was like in the world, all the trees will just go down and, and there will be no air and people will be dying. Mm -hmm. And those thoughts came to you, had you had those thoughts before this experience? No. No. And did, how did those thoughts come to you? Did they come to you from the craft or from? From the man. The man. And the man, did the man say those things to you? Uh, how did he get that across to you? Well, he never said anything. It's just that the face is the eyes. What was the sense you got from those eyes? He was interested. The girl here is, is saying maybe the world is going to end because we um, don't look after the planet and the air properly. All, trees, all the trees go down and there will be no air. People will be dying. I tend to take this incident rather seriously. The reported incident has the least element of a hoax, and the aliens do not seem to have any ulterior motive in turning up to the school children and communicating to them. The message is quite clear. Without anything cryptic or symbolic codified in, uh, literally is about uh, the impending collapse of the Earth's ecological system. What scientists did uh, in many pages of numbers and diagrams, the aliens did in a few words. Basically, they're saying your race, together with other life forms, could perish with the evaporation of breathable air as a result of your carelessness. I said abductions belong to either category one or category two, depending on the degree that the way that aliens convey environmentally significant messages. But what about the cases which appear to harbor no environmentally significant elements? 
These cases carry all the marks typical to alien abduction, and yet devoid of any ecologically significant episodes. And since this category constitutes another big portion of abduction reports, perhaps some might argue that environmental crisis is not really on aliens' agenda. But there is a caveat in saying this, however. It is highly possible that some talks about the physical condition of the planet occurred during abduction, but only the memory was lost. This could be either due to deliberate suppression of the memory by aliens, or perhaps the abductee's inability to overcome traumatic uh, uh, experience and the consequent suppression of the whole uh, abduction process. In fact, some abductees recall ecologically significant episodes at a much later stage in their life. Um, in addition, even if they don't have any conscious memory, many abductees subsequently become acutely interested in environmental issues, and sometimes they actively participate in environmental protection movements. So undoubtedly it is uh, in the first and second categories cases that aliens show more environmental specific concerns, and yet we cannot exclude the possibility that even the cases apparently without any direct relevance uh, could in fact entail environmental elements. I have tried to present a cases, uh, case for positive relationship between abduction and hybrid project, uh, environmental crisis, but what about the hybrid project? If the hybrid project is integral and central to abduction cases, then, well, as David Jacobs and uh, Bob Hawkins argue, and I agree with them, there must be also positive relationship between uh, hybrid project and um, environmental crisis. It may be more or less assumed that the hybrid project is a response to this impending demise of human civilization. What we do not know at this stage is precisely how the, pre uh, the project is a response to this crisis. Or perhaps aliens will never tell us and will never know about it. What they have said so far are only three short sentences. This is important. We must do it. We have the right to do so. Whatever we assume to be the alien's intention is bound to be only speculative at this stage. But for the sake of setting a stage for further talks, let me exercise a little bit of this speculation. As to the way the production of hybrids can be a response to the impending demise of the human race, there are three possibilities. Um, one of them, the first is that they are producing hybrids as a seed species that will be or are already being relocated to another planet or to another world. Underlying the scenario is an assumption that in the end we all die and the Earth will be deserted forever. This scenario can answer the often raised question, where are all the hybrids produced so far? The answer according to this scenario is that aliens have transported them to another star or to another dimension where they can and are assimilating and flourishing. One drawback of this scenario, however, is that although environmental crisis may inflict serious damage to the life-supporting capacity of the Earth, the planet may still retain some ability to rejuvenate itself after a certain period of desertification. It may be able to become a beautiful planet again, where life can prosper and evolve to an advanced stage. And perhaps the catastrophe may wipe out the present human species and other advanced uh, evolved animals, but surely it may not be able to eradicate all life forms uh, on the Earth. Um, this leads to the second scenario. 
Hybrids will become a new species which will gradually replace the human species while offering solution to the present problem. Uh, this scenario obviously brings David, David Jacobs hypothesis, but the only difference is in this case, the intervention is uh, of a benign kind. Um, hybrids will adapt, adapt to human society, visibly or invisibly, and devise, to, devise ways to solve the present environmental problem. The process of solution will include setting of technological innovation, exercising political leadership, and restructuring the global economic and financial system. Yet, uh, this, well, this scenario has merit in that hybrids, as I said at the beginning, uh, they can easily hide themselves uh, among us, so they can do something for the good of ours uh, secretly, and they look quite similar to us. However, uh, if uh, this scenario is to be true, Given the pace of uh, global warming that is maximally stretching the self-sustaining capacity of the Earth, around by now, there must be visible influence, influence of these hybrids on major processes of world economy and politics. However, we do not have any signs whatsoever such uh, development yet. No distinctive group of strange humans, strange humans so far uh, have been identified who possess very special intellect and distinctly future-oriented political vision together with financial power large enough to stop the climate change. In fact, what we are seeing at the moment is the world is actually moving towards the very opposite direction. So this scenario has its own limitation. The last scenario is we are, uh, or aliens are producing hybrids as a new species that will repopulate the Earth, but only after the Earth is left deserted for a certain period of time. The hybrids will be brought down to the Earth again when the Earth ecosystem regains ability to support advanced life again. And this scenario improves on the drawbacks of the previous two scenarios. But it is not without its own weakness. According to James Hansen, again, it takes 10 years for atmospheric methane to turn into CO2, and about one third of a carbon dioxide emission remains in the atmosphere after 100 years, and one quarter still remain after 500 years. So therefore, it will take several hundred years or even several thousand years until the Earth ecosystem becomes clean again after the extinction of advanced life. But do the hybrids have such a long life expectancy? And where will they be staying while all these things are taking place on the Earth? Uh, spaceships look quite small, and I don't think they will be happy to stay there bumping into each other for an extended period of time. But there are solutions to these problems. While the Earth remains unable to support life, the hybrids can be relocated to another planet and proliferate there. Regardless of their life expectancy, they can maintain a sizable population through reproduction until the time is ripe on the Earth. Moreover, they have half-human gene, so what would all the genetic engineering have been about if they are not meant to come back to the Earth? So the third scenario has answers to all these questions. The real weakness is this. Why will they go through the hassle of remigration to the Earth when they have happily settled in their own world? I accept that this, is, this protest is quite reasonable, and it sounds all the more so, given that they have half human, sorry, alien genes that undoubtedly will assist them to assimilate to a different planetary environment. We have a very little hint about aliens' intention, and these three scenarios are equally or plausible, or for the same reason, equally implausible. Um, whichever scenarios uh, you might prefer, uh, they have all one common assumption, the impending demise of human civilization. Um, and this is one of the likely outcomes of the present development of the environmental crisis, and possibly aliens decided that human race uh, do not have any hope. That is not, should not be our immediate concern, 
our immediate concern should be whether this beautiful planet will turn into another this due to our carelessness and stupidity. I think we must act now, and if we act now, then we can save ourselves. Uh, not only can we self, uh, save, save ourselves, but also we can prove to aliens that they were wrong, wrong in calculating our technological prowess, but also wrong in this, uh, judging about our moral capacity. After all, I believe the human race may not have that foolish and that stupid and that bad. Let's hope for that together. Thank you. I just, uh, I'd just like to pick up on a little point there that you played um, Marie's uh, yeah, yeah. soundtrack that yeah. she specifically refers to a terrible blackness which is um, going to kill everything, and also the re reference to the blues. I don't know if you're familiar with our next speaker's work that we've just recorded now, Joanne. We put it together, a very special thing about a black oil, a mysterious black oil. Which, intelligent material, you uh, mentioned. You know, which uh, is planned or could be designed to delete all life on Earth. That was the bit behind the Falklands War. And the yeah, Gulf I heard oil about stuff. that, yes. Yeah. But we've just received video just before the conference of the blowout preventer, which was involved with the um, Gulf oil spill. And inside that, it's, this is on the surface, it's uh, surrounded as a concrete cast that was put around the blowout pre uh, preventer. And the BP heard noises out of this thing. And they opened it up and they could actually see this black goo eating the metal in real time mm, of see. the mm. blowout preventer. Not as in a corrosive element, but well, as in a life. Destroying light, actually it? living, yeah. t you can actually see it moving. So the living world, living tissue, or living, living well, life on it. It seemed to be evolving oh, into something, but it I seems to be very right, striking right. Based, based on what you I, just I, said. I haven't, I haven't come across that, uh, well, that, that's uh, that the story, most and I have to, actually I have to look at that uh, substance. Uh, I thought perhaps, uh, perhaps Mari might have a better idea uh, because I was looking at through the lens of environmental yeah. crisis, well, what, what, uh, some what, kind of, you know, well, it, I, I didn't say that clearly, but uh, the blacker things that Mari uh, has seen uh, aboard was perhaps permafrost melt. Uh, and it is seriously, it is uh, threatening really the, yeah, well, the this, whole this, existence. This seems very things. striking that yeah. the, the latest uh, Amash, uh, David, yeah. combination actually politics UK and everything, we all got together. Yeah. And this I, scenario is precisely I, what I tend to I tend to treat things uh, materially uh, rather than symbolically or... Yeah. In a, in a, yeah. Well, this is um, the, the major crisis. Factor. Yes, I, I have to look at that. that, yeah. that, yeah. that this is yeah. based on our upload. We're receiving new information all the time. Right. right. So it right. seems striking that that's precisely yes. the yeah. scenario you, you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. and it seems like in Marie's uh, dreams. Yeah. Very clear, but I hope we're all going to survive. Thank you. Anyway, thank, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Thank well, thank you. you very much, everyone, for listening. We have one last speaker, and that is David Griffin, World Exoplanet. Okay, with a very exciting next We're going to take five days just to set up technically, so quick new break, everybody. There is some water still available, and uh, we are going to. Um